It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Brian Heron. Brian has a bachelor's, a DVM, and a PhD all from Oklahoma State University. He uh, joined us in uh, College of Veterinary Medicine in 2017, I believe. He uh, manages the, our parasitology lab. He's uh, board certified in, uh, by the Academy of Veterinary Microbiologists, uh, sub species or sub uh, specialty parasitology, uh, which is very unique. Uh, he's also very heavily involved in all kinds of research. He has particular interests in ticks and tick-borne diseases and fleas and flea-borne diseases. But he's also very, very active in teaching and mentoring uh, veterinary students. He's known as a, a great educator within the College of Veterinary Medicine. And uh, in 2022, he actually won uh, was awarded a very uh, prestigious uh, Excellence in Teaching Award. So uh, we're, we're very, very lucky to have Dr. Heron take time out of his day to go through this webinar. So with that, again, if you have issues or questions or whatever, uh, put them in the chat or in the Q&A at the top and we'll, we'll go from there. So I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Brian Heron. I'm one of two parasitologists here at the at Kansas State. Uh, we both work at the Case VDL and take turns on service. So what we're seeing is uh, a mixture, right, today of the small animal parasites. We'll go from kind of the basic end towards maybe some of the more challenging cases or the cases that get funneled towards myself and Dr. Jebba. Um, via consultation from veterinarians like you. So we always start with, you know, why are we doing these fecal examinations? Why is this a thing that has just become part of routine small animal practice? And I think we've done a really good job of educating our clients that it's a big portion of making sure that we have healthy pets, um, making sure the whole family is healthy. So many of these parasites are zoonotic and that gives us the potential to break that life cycle and keep the whole family healthy. Uh, these uh, routine fecals, we say, hey, I'm using all these products, maybe on a monthly basis. Why do we even need to do a fecal? We need to check in to make sure what we think is working is actually working. So it's our kind of yearly or every six month check in to see, are we doing what we think we are doing? And then after treatment, maybe evaluating was our treatment effective? And I'll highlight some examples on why checking in on your deworming protocol might be important. I think the big one here is a study published a few years ago where they went around to random dog parks across the US and collected just 10 random samples from, from dogs in those uh, dog parks. And you can see that at least one parasite was detected in about 20% of the samples uh, so individual samples that they looked at. And then when you take into kind of the whole dog park system, 85% of dog parks tested positive for one parasite. And, and honestly, if they would have taken t more than 10 samples, I would have said 100% are positive. And so even though your dog, the client you're looking at, they may be very good at their compliance with the products they're using, they're going out into these environments where they're exposed to parasites and it may, may be covered. That's why our preventives are there. They're pulse dewormers getting rid of those parasites. It may not cover, right? And so it's worth checking in on a yearly basis. And what, what they found was when you looked at kind of the breakdown, uh, the overall percentage, you know, about 40% of these um, samples uh, we're positive for young animals. We see that drop down. There's an age-related immunity uh, to many of these. Uh, nematodes specifically, uh, I would agree with Giardia. There's some kind of immune uh, piece to clearing that as well. So you see as they get older, they may be more likely to be on a preventive as well. And so it kind of evens out. But those young animals, they, they are a parasite factory for sure. <clears throat> when we look at kind of the breakdown of nematodes, uh, hookworms, roundworms, whipworms. That's what we see in practice. That's what we see uh, sent into us. Um, and so you're all very familiar. Hookworms, by far the, the most common that was found in this uh, study, followed by actually whipworms, which is surprising to me. And then 
uh, roundworms. Our, our roundworms, there is a much stronger age-related immunity, and so even at that one year, we have kind of a reduction, but still out there and around. When we look at kind of IDing those parasites, um, I have some kind of large data, and then I have some stuff that we chat with our students about here at K-State. So when you look at types of fecal testing done, there's still a vast majority of practitioners that are doing in-clinic uh, fecals. I think this data is maybe a little bit old, and there is a shift towards using a reference lab to do fecal testing, and if, and if you're doing that or thinking about that, happy to chat about that at a different time. But there's still many of you out there that are doing fecals in practice, and when, when surveyed about what type of fecal, again, the breakdown is about 66, it hits pretty um, evenly, 66% are doing passive flotations versus centrifugal flotations. And as we work through this first part, hopefully we'll talk about why really you should consider shifting towards a centrifugal flotation if you want to keep that fecal flotation in-house. So let's get into the large data. We actually chat with our students who come in and many of them maybe have worked in practices with you. And so we ask them, uh, you know, have you ever run a fecal in a practice? And what do you do? Uh, we still see a lot that use in-house. This year I gave them the option of both, so there may be some tests they feel more, more comfortable sending out, but still a good number that are uh, in-house fecal floats. A, a wide variety, so I let them kind of choose uh, any or all they do. And so many do a direct smear, so just looking for modal parasites, not really great at concentrating or trying to find low level infections. Still a higher number doing passive flotations, so those standing flotations, uh, more than centrifugal, and then a lot are, a lot are using antigen testing, uh, probably specifically thinking about the majority of antigen tests that's used most commonly in clinics. So there is a wide variety, but still that passive flotation kind of wins out. And we know from, uh, we, we, we do these projects with our students every year just to show them that passive flotation is maybe insensitive. We do it with veterinarians, vet technicians, and this data I'm about to show, we had each participant do uh, fecal techniques on a composite. It had, you know, not a non-standardized amount of hookworms, roundworms, and whipworms. And they did a direct smear, they did a passive technique, they did a centrifugation with what is a low specific gravity solution and then a fecal with a high specific gravity solution. And the, the results pan out. We're really just asking them, did you find the parasite? Yes, no, that's it. Uh, not even a, a number they found. And when you look at it consistently, the direct fecal smear is very insensitive. We know that it's really just best for modal parasites moving around you want to see on fresh samples but it has no concentrating ability so it's very insensitive when we look at the passive flotation it may be able to do okay so detecting about 70 percent of the time uh, hookworms and then lower for roundworms as the specific gravity goes up of the parasite so the parasite eggs get heavier it becomes less able to float those parasites. So when we get to whipworms, about 40% of the time they find whipworm eggs in what I would consider a completely infected sample. So the same participants that are finding it 40% of the time on a passive flotation are finding it upwards of 80 to 96% on an active or centrifugal flotation based on the solution. So the specific gravity comes into play because we have these heavier eggs like our whipworms that are just hard to float. And if you use a specific gravity of zinc sulfates of 1.18, it's right on that level. So you'll float some, maybe you don't float all of them. And you see with the lighter eggs, the zinc, it, it compares very closely. Uh, the hookworm 95 to 96%, the roundworm 92 to 95%, very close. It's again with those heavy eggs that, that higher specific gravity solution outperforms. So when we're talking about why we should be using high specific gravity solutions and why we should be doing centrifugal flotations is you're accurately diagnosing more parasites. So these are appropriately uh, diagnosing dogs that are actually infected. 
So some tips and tricks, we talked about the right solution. Many times I say uh, we should use a high specific gravity solution. That is true if you're going to do a centrifugal flotation. If you use a passive flotation, it just kind of turns into muck and you end up kind of trying to pull the eggs through. And so a heavier solution with passive doesn't make it kind of a little bit better. It actually makes it worse. And so you want to pair the solution appropriately. So if you are using a high specific gravity solution, that goes with centrifugal flotation. So when we have a high solution, we're spinning these heavy eggs, they all float. If we were to use a lower specific gravity solution and we spin them, they sink. So it is a, a matter of physics. And, and honestly, if the egg is heavier than the solution is in terms of specific gravity, if you spin it, they sink faster, right? So we are trying to use a high sheather sugar solution to, to float these eggs. When we think about the right sample, we're looking for fresh feces. So somewhere in the last day or so, trying to collect, um, if you're having the owner collect and bring it into an exam, making sure it's as fresh as possible. We say two to five grams of feces is, is really ideal. Um, you know, maybe not the best uh, imagery for the lunch hour, but I always tell my students, a Hershey's Kiss, they say is 4.5 grams. So if you're thinking about a size, it should be something like that. And we know that if you, um, uh, decrease that sample size, you have a less sensitive recovery of parasites. So again, I have a non-standardized sample uh, graph here. So obviously there's way more hookworms in this sample than roundworms or whipworms. And you see from five grams to two grams, there's a, a, a somewhat decrease in our uh, sensitivity. From two to one, it goes down. Actually at one gram, we see a much higher drop off in our actual sensitivity in the test. Uh, so from 1 to 0.5 grams. And if you're thinking about the fecal loop wands that are used in practice, the large one often collects about 0.5 grams. So if that is what you're using, you may be getting a, a sample on the lower end of, of what's um, useful. So many practices find ways to have um, owners bring samples into their uh, appointment or send them home with a cup to drop one off. And that is so you can ensure you know, a fresh and, and a sample that's large enough to adequately evaluate. Uh, the right equipment. So for those centrifugal floats, you need a centrifuge. And they don't quite make one that is a one-stop shop and it does blood really well and, and, and fecal floats really well. We're spinning them around 12 to 1500 RPMs. And I'll be honest, it's a little bit messy, right? And I think many of your technicians may be uh, experienced with cleaning the, the salt or sugar solution out of the centrifuges. If your practice is looking for one, um, not, not paid for by me, but this uh, centrifuge is my favorite one because the bucket actually comes out and can be rinsed out more easily if your technicians are kind of tired of that digging arm in and around and trying to uh, clean the centrifuges. And so there are many options for fecal centrifuges uh, that would fit kind of on your countertop. Again, that's a kind of counter space issue in, in many clinics. Uh, but if you are considering doing fecal floats, the, this centrifuge and the centrifugal floats are the way to go. So the other thing is the right training. And, and I ask my vet students how prepared do they feel to set up diagnostic tests when they're in a practice? And the good news is there's very few that are in the no training. You know, I just showed up here today and, and I'm, I'm going for it. And I think a lot of us know and understand that vet med is very hands-on learning. And so you get a quick run through of, of what you should be doing and then you learn as you go. So a vast majority said, I had some training and then I kind of got my feet underneath me. Uh, with no, actually a good quarter that felt like they had adequate training. So I think that's really uh, good news. I would encourage you to develop a, a specific SOP, a plan for running your samples. That way it's done consistently and you know you can read them in a consistent manner. So developing an SOP, so it, it alleviates a little bit of the protocol drift where one tech trains the next tech that trains the assistant and, and things are lost in there. Um, and then creating positive control slides. And 
Uh, so for some tips and tricks on how to do your fecals, uh, the KSVDL, I just uh, <laughs> searched flotation in the top of our KSVDL website and came up with this list of articles. And we have two, so a few that are how to increase the value of your fecal diagnostics. That is kind of the logistics on how to do the procedure and, and how to do it well. And so if you're looking to develop an SOP um, or kind of train some people, there are some resources on the KSVDL website. It'll even jump you to uh, the KSVDL YouTube channel in which there is a walkthrough on how to do a good fecal flotation. So there's resources out there if you're looking to train your staff. If you're um, thinking about reading these samples, this is where it gets challenging. And so 65% uh, of students asked if they were asked to read or interpret tests said yes. And I totally remember being in practice and finding my first coccidia. I had no idea what I was looking at. It was just a lot of the same thing. And I called my veterinarian over. Um, and I can tell you from our students coming in, I love our vet students. They're great. They are not very good at fecal diagnostics. And so there are some things that you might be able to do in practice to help out with that for your technicians. One is creating positive control slides. And we do this with everything. So if you find a good fecal float, it has hookworms, roundworms, whipworms, a little bit of everything. You can actually use fingernail polish around the cover slip to keep the air out and keep that slide in the fridge. And that way you can use it to train your staff and say, oh, you think you found a hookworm? Let's look at the hookworm positive control sample. And so this one says Giardia in zinc. And so this is a good Giardia positive control that we can go back and look and help our staff train on what things look like. We're trying to train our eyes. And, and then this is what my fridge uh, in our lab ends up looking like. You know, all the colors, uh, whatever is cheap and on sale uh, for fingernail polish. And that way we have lots of references for our staff to look at in comparison to what they're seeing on the sample today. So I think that's a really good option. Additionally, uh, the KSVDL website, that list of kind of flotation uh, articles. There's some uh, newsletters for diagnosing intestinal parasites of dogs and cats. It has some good images and what I think about when I'm looking at hookworms, roundworms, whipworms, coccidia in these samples. So another two articles that may be helpful um, for training your staff. So when we're thinking about, we've got our staff trained we're, we're finding parasites, and we've mentioned a bunch, hookworms, roundworms, whipworms. The common things happen so commonly. So hookworms, we're mainly talking about Ancelosum and caninum here in the U.S. And although you see them in practice every single day, I just want to point out a few things. One is that life cycle of the hookworm can actually happen in between our heartworm preventive doses. If you're giving a monthly dewormer, for uh, heartworm prevention, the hookworm life cycle can happen in between that. And so we want to keep that in mind if you think you're seeing non-drug responsive, think about when you're testing, or even think about adding in treatments at the two-week period in between those monthly doses to break the life cycle, get the pet kind of out of that uh, environmental contamination, and then move forward with the monthly deworming after that. We are seeing multi-drug resistant hookworms. So these are cases that, that we're seeing coming in that they've just tried and tried to get rid of. And I think that adds the value of the recheck fecal of making sure the treatment you did use was effective. So the, this is kind of the, the narrowed down number of cases that maybe I see here at the diagnostic lab that you don't see many of or haven't seen yet, but I think you'll probably see more of. So we have these multi-drug resistant hookworms. They probably came out of the racing greyhound industry um, just due to how those animals are managed. Although I've seen it spill over into other hunting uh, groups that are in kennel such situations and even just individual pets. If you look at uh, the number of racing greyhounds that get adopted and become pets and maybe they head out to one of those dog parks that 85% of them have a parasite, you can see how it's easy to transfer over into our pet population. When we say multi-drug resistant, many are non-responsive to parental, our benzimidazoles like fenbendazole or the macrocyclactones, so that gives us not a lot of options moving forward. One of the questions I get is, 
well, if is am I making the problem worse? I'm recommending that our pet owners deworm monthly. Is is that causing um, more resistance? And I would say it's unlikely that it's the true driver for resistance, um, where it's going to create more issues. Uh, with our pet population, we're usually structurally treating, we're evaluating how our protocol is going, we're reducing parasites. <laughs> and uh, remember, there's all those dogs that go to the dog parks that are positive. That counts as refugia or the percent of parasites that don't see a drug. And so uh, there is a lot of refugia out there. The greyhound industry, they were managed a little bit more intensively like... Um, uh, some of our large animals in which the deworming is pretty intense. There's not follow-up testing and all animals may be treated at the same time. They're kept in the same environment and so that there's no refugia or no susceptible parasites left out there. So you're unlikely to drive resistance with keeping your client's pets on prevention. So what can we do? Um, you can continue to do your fecal floats if you find hookworms. Uh, then you treat them as appropriate and then I think it's more prudent than ever to follow that up with a, a fecal float, you know, two weeks afterwards. Uh, some of our um, uh, information comes from uh, groups doing research on these resistant hookworms and this was an article published in Clinician's Brief a, a few years ago and, and you can access that. Uh, and they found that the kind of holdout drugs for these um, multi-drug resistant hookworms, the topical moxidectin, specifically the topical formulation, seems to perform differently. And so they comboed that, which is Advantage Multi is the brand name, with, with Dronto Plus, and they were able to get rid of these hookworms over time. And I'll kind of talk about a case where I managed those that way. Um, this article also talks about... Um, the use of imidepside, and so we're hoping to get the canine formulation into the U.S. here soon. It talks about using the feline formulation, and I just want to caution everyone, right, these are off-label uses of that specific drug, and, and you'd want to make sure you have a really good working relationship with that client before you move to using the feline um, product, right? And again, uh, the publication in Clinician's Brief kind of works through how you might want to use that. Um, it's kind of a last resort, and hopefully thinking through this case that I had might help you see what you could do before going to really off-label use of things. So this is a dog that we had a chronic history of hookworms before it came to us, and we started to get a little bit more information. Uh, they were using both flotation and IDEX's antigen tests, so the antigen positive here would be IDEX's antigen test they offer. And by the time that we saw them, they were already recommending uh, Advantage Multi, and they were doing it every three weeks instead of every four weeks at that point. So they were already kind of feeling the pressure of the drug-resistant hookworms. And they'd given three doses and decided to follow up in May. And it was positive again. You can see it was positive on float, uh, negative on, on antigen. Not super surprising when we look at if you're dosing every three weeks, your third dose is somewhere around April 7th, and then you have almost a month before that May, um, May 1st check-in. So again, that hookworm could, could still be reinfection. We haven't ruled that out because our deworming is not quite uh, at the timeline to really rule out reinfection. And so one of the first things I would say in managing these cases, if you are seeing repeat positive hookworms, is deworming every two weeks. And that way you're really trying to break that life cycle. So then the, the next round was they did move it to every two weeks. Um, that, that was an interesting antigen negative. I, I don't have a lot of time to just chat about all those diagnostics. We still had eggs in the float, so there's still environmental contamination. And that's one of the things we're trying to get rid of. So that dog did need multiple tr more treatments. We get down to July and it's still float and antigen positive. And this is where uh, many owners get really frustrated because they, they're doing what you're asking and still seeing um, hookworms or egg shedding. And it's not really concerning for me. Uh, I've seen multiple rounds uh, that it takes several months to get rid of these hookworms. 
this might have been a good time where we could have switched to quantitative floats to see if the egg numbers are decreasing after each deworming. And I'll chat a little bit about that because these qualitative just kind of say, yep, they're there. And at some point you may want to structure quantitative fecal floats in with your uh, deworming every two weeks. And then by November, we got to the point where we were float negative, antigen positive. And, you know, I think that here we've reached a point where I am very comfortable saying we've, we've cleared these animals. Um, we're trying to reduce a few things. We're trying to reduce clinical disease. So if this dog is not uh, having clinical disease, that's good news. And we're trying to reduce the environmental shedding so that there's not eggs going in the environment. That antigen they're detecting is interesting, and we may be detecting worms before they're out there laying eggs, before they're causing a lot of clinical disease. And so I've seen a few that are, remain antigen positive um, and float negative. With that, I tell veterinarians to kind of hold the course. This dog probably needs to be on that Advantage Multi monthly for its life. It seems to be the preventive that's working for it. And kind of continue the course unless clinical signs or egg shedding pops back up. So these are kind of really challenging cases. One of the things you saw, I was really protracted. The things you have to do before saying, this is resistance, I just can't manage this, is make sure that this is not reinfection, make sure that the owner has been uh, giving the drug compliantly, uh, start treating every two weeks to break that life cycle, and think about doing fecal egg count reductions. And so that is a quantitative fecal float. And we do those here at K-State. So if you're doing qualitatives in your practice uh, and looking for eggs, but aren't comfortable doing quantitatives, you can send those in to the KSVDL and we're happy to give you numbers and help you interpret through those cases. Because like I said, it has taken a few treatments to fully clear some of these dogs and we're just watching those egg numbers drop over time. For our roundworms, I, I just like to point out to all my students that the transplacental, it's listed transuterine here, transplacental transmission of this parasite from the mother to puppies is so common that we just want to consider any puppy to be roundworm infected, right? And then if we start with the baseline there, then it's not really surprising that we see roundworms a lot in our young puppies. <clears throat> Depending on the route of infection, that pre-patent period or that time where we can detect eggs uh, can be fairly short and in between those hardware and preventive doses again. And so we want to think about that when we're, when we're managing uh, our roundworms as well. One of the things I think is helpful for in your practice is to look and see what else is going on and put maybe your practice's numbers in the scope of kind of around the US or, or even closer. So this is from the Companion Animal Parasite Council. And you can see nationwide, this is 8.6 million tests done. 1.5% uh, of dogs test positive for roundworms. You can make these really local information in which you drop down into Kansas, uh, which is 1.4%. That fits with the national average, but your clinic may or may not be different. And you can check in with your area or see maybe how your patients compare to, you know, what's going on around you. So if we look to some of these orange counties, not all the orange counties are the same, right? And here, um, this is Leavenworth County in Southern Kansas. It has a higher percent positive, 4.4%. That's a low number of tests, only 68 tests in that, that year. So that can kind of skew the data. If you're thinking, man, there's no way I see that many. This data may be skewed by the number of tests, but you could also take this and say, hey, one in 30 dogs in this area tests positive. What is, one in 20 dogs test positive uh, for roundworms. You know, I maybe see 15 to 20 patients a day that, that risk is high and you can let owners know, we see this parasite. Uh, is it every pet? No. Does it come in waves? Is it every puppy that comes in? Probably so. And our older dogs, not so much. 
You can use this information as a motivator to say, hey, we, this parasite's real. We see it here. One in 20 pets you know, test positive for it. And uh, this is why we recommend you be on good prevention. Now, if you jump to here, then we have 3.3%. It's a little bit of a drop in percentage, but now we have 2,500 tests that are positive. And honestly, that becomes a level where this is a true number of positives. That may mean this practice works with a shelter group that is seeing pets that you know, are less likely to be on previous prevention. So again, if your practice is right around there and you think, I don't see that many, maybe your practice is structured differently, but it is helpful to say that this parasite's real, it is commonly seen, and when pets are not on prevention, uh, it is very common, right? What was it, 20% of the fecals that were tested in the dog parks were positive for at least one parasite. So it's a way to make it local and timely for, for your clients so it's a real, real issue. It's especially helpful for those that are on really good um, compliant prevention to encourage them to continue that, right? For our whipworms, this is a, a really interesting parasite in that there's not a lot of age-related immunity. And so we do see this kind of taper out into older dogs. And how I see it present is, you know, an older dog that is on a routine preventive, but perhaps that preventive is not effective against whipworms. And you know, one of the key things is parental is used all the time. Parental is very effective against hookworms and, and roundworms. It is not effective against whipworms. And so if that's the kind of deworming portion, it's not covering whipworms. And that's kind of the pitch of all these um, monthly preventives that you, you have in your clinic or new ones that are coming out in the market. They're not all created equal, and it's worth looking at the back of the label, um, seeing what it does cover, and seeing if that matches the parasites that you see in your practice or that you're concerned about, right? And it may be different for different areas, right? Uh, people in Louisiana, probably most concerned about heartworm. People that live in Lyme, Connecticut are thinking about Lyme disease, right? And so the preventive program that you schedule for your clients is really based on what are your important parasites. And we just want to remember that not all of the preventives can catch every single parasite. We also think about movement of animals. So if you're in an area, an area where you think, ah, I used to not see that many parasites, I'm seeing more, we're seeing a drastic movement of, of people and pets that are moving their parasites as well. So there's a lot of movement of animals from shelters in the south uh, U.S. to more northern states. They're bringing their parasites with them. We're seeing people move the country uh, for their jobs or working remotely, and they're moving their pets and their parasites with them. So this is a dynamic thing in which you may begin to see new parasites in new areas. That's why just having really good fecal diagnostic techniques can help you kind of broad spectrumly catch those as they come into your practice. For our whipworms, right, they're, they're mainly kind of a south-southeast, but when you look at kind of the data, uh, you see that Colorado falls into one of the states that's increasing the most in hookworm or in whipworm cases, and it's because there's a huge movement of, of dogs from Texas and Louisiana up into Colorado, and that's been kind of really well documented that that movement of animals is affecting the pet pop the parasite populations in Colorado. We jump from our nematodes to our, our protozoal organisms. Cis or isosporas are uh, coccidia of dogs and cats. These protozoa are so prolific in their reproduction one of those oocysts can turn into thousands in a puppy, and that's how it gets out of control very fast. The thing to keep in mind is there's a couple of different species in dogs and cats. They both have a, a large version of coccidia that looks kind of like the ones pictured here. They are kind of teardrop shaped. They also have a small one, which is like almost a perfect circle. So we have to keep in mind there's going to be some variation in size of the coccidia that we see. 
But coccidia in general are mainly an issue of young animals. They develop some immunity over time and it can usually handle that parasite unless they're in confinement. And it doesn't have to be like mean confinement, you know, in a smaller area in which the environmental contamination overwhelms the immune system. And so what we're trying to kind of set the stage to pause for is making sure that we're thinking about the actual coccidia that infects dogs and cats, Cystoisospora, keeping it separate from the coccidia that infects our ruminants, so cattle, sheep, goats, geese, uh, rabbits are probably a really high offender. For a student wet lab, I just grabbed rabbit feces from my front yard and it had coccidia in it, right? And uh, the dogs that are out on walks, they're gobbling up everything, maybe goose poop, maybe rabbit poop. You may see coccidia pass through and they, they could be imeria. So um, things you can do, one, if we have an adult dog, it's just in for wellness. That's not who we normally see coccidia clinically present in. So that may have you ask the owner, does your dog, uh, you know, eat rabbit poop or goose poop that you know of? And they may say, yep, I know that. Or they may fall into the second category of they don't know that their dog eats poop. Because there's only two. Dogs that eat poop and dogs whose owners don't know they eat poop, right? And so uh, you want to try to see if they know what's going on. There's some features you could look for. So I marry the, the coccidia of our kind of ruminants and rabbits, uh, has a little micropile cap. It's tough to see always. It's like a little polar plug there. It's a clear plug. And if you see it, you have Imeria and you can kind of move on. If you don't, it doesn't really tell you much because not all Imeria has it. So that's why it's really, I think, most important to take that clinical picture into mind. If you have an adult healthy dog, they're in for wellness, you find coccidia, maybe it does warrant treatment. I don't, I don't think that that's um, overtly you know, a bad thing to think is let's just go ahead and give it a, a dose of Albon. Uh, the concerning thing or the issue arises with those recheck fecals and the uh, dog still has coccidia and still has coccidia and still has coccidia. No clinical signs, happy, healthy, normal. And uh, then you consult with myself or Dr. Jebba and we say, mm, sorry, this is Imeria. This dog is not truly infected. It's like a marvel passing through. So anytime you see coccidia in adult, healthy animals, you want to think, is this dog in a confinement space where it may be, you know, infected with cystoisospora? Is it in contact with puppies, you know, hanging out with uh, younger animals in its home, maybe even the dog park, right? Um, or is this just uh, rabbit coccidia that's just passing straight through? The management is definitely a clinical setting situation. But I overall just want everyone to pause and think when you see coccidia in adult healthy dogs. The true battle, Giardia. This is the number one consult that Dr. Jebba and myself get. And uh, the reinfection potential is so common that I would assume that that's the most likely scenario is that dog is going to be infected again rather than I'm going to use this treatment course and everything's going to go away. So we have to do a lot of environmental management. And then we want to think about, you know, how to manage these follow-ups. Because many times the dog is positive in the follow-up, but clinically normal. And so the Companion Animal Parasite Council says, you have a dog that's positive for Giardia. It's the first time you've seen it. Probably warrants treatment. That Giardia is not doing anything good in there. If you're following up, you may want to take into account if they're clinically ill or not. If they're not clinically ill, then you may consider benign neglect or deciding other factors, you know, other, other animals or other reasons why you should treat. If they're clinically ill, obviously, you want to retest, you want to treat, you want to look for other parasites, but we uh, get into this kind of cycle of retesting. If you wanted to actually see if that treatment worked, you would test about two days after your, your dose. So if you gave five days of henbenazole, you probably want to retest at day seven. Many retest a week after their uh, drug is finished, and that really just sees if the animal is reinfected because Giardia can kind of complete its life cycle in about six days. And so if you test a week after your treatment protocol, so day 14, um, then you, you've really just shown that the dog is reinfected or not. 
I see a lot of protracted Giardia uh, cases, and there's something about the immune system that is challenging. They're young animals, and I think sometimes they just need a few rounds of treatment, unfortunately, until their immune system can actually play a role in trying to keep the Giardia away. It's common. I don't even understand how the whole map of the U.S. isn't completely dark orange. This is so common to see, and many of you are experiencing this practice. If you're trying to find them on flotation, it gets challenging because I spent time talking about why you should use a sugar solution with a high specific gravity, but if you do that with Giardia, you end up with these weird shapes, and I think they're difficult even for trained people to identify as an actual parasite, not a random artifact. So that's why the that's why we talk about that lower specific gravity solution. It is useful for floating Giardia. Now, I think maybe a, a more reasonable combo, given how hard Giardia is to find on slides, is using a high specific gravity to look for your nematode eggs and potentially using an antigen test for dogs that are clinically ill if you're trying to assess if they have Giardia as well. And I think that might be a good combination where you're doing a high quality fecal float to look for eggs and the Giardia antigen test when there's clinically ill animals and you suspect Giardia. Kind of the last big group are tapeworms. And I, I put them all on here. We see Diplidium a lot. We see Tania a lot. The eggs don't float that easily. We mainly diagnose them by the owners complaining about proglottids or seeing something moving in their dog's feces. And so it's tough when we don't have a great way to diagnose them on our own. And many of the heartworm preventives or our monthly preventives don't cover tapeworms. So they can kind of fall through the cracks. And if you're looking and you're thinking, man, I don't know. I don't, I can't remember the shapes of these proglottids. Like that was too long ago. If you had Dr. Dryden, he probably made you memorize them. And I agree. I think that it's challenging. And so instead of looking at the actual proglottid and trying to ID it, in clinic, I think it's super reasonable to put that proglottid onto a slide with a little saline, crush it up, put a cover slip, and look at the eggs. So for diplidium, we have these big egg packets. If you look closer, right, they, you can see they have a tapeworm egg, they have the hooks in there. But the diplidium, they're really distinct big egg packets, and that may help you make sure that you're on the right um, track because we're also seeing um, issues with diplidium. So, we're seeing multiple reports of kind of persistent proglottid shedding. And some things, again, to think about, the life cycle can happen in two to three weeks. So it can happen in between our preventive doses. Its vector is the flea, and so you really have to nail down your flea control to actually eliminate these infections. But there's true resistance um, to proziquantal, and the other parasitologist here at K-State, Dr. Dr. Jebba, uh, does research on drug resistance. She's working with the hookworms um, and now with the tapeworms. A published paper of some cases in which proziquantal leave it at higher doses was not effective at controlling this tapeworm. Despite good flea control, high doses of proziquantal, still proglottid shedding. So we know this is something that happens. What I think you should think about first is ruling out reinfection always, uh, making, so good flea control, making sure it's diplidium, making sure it's actually a tapeworm, so uh, hitting some of the basics, um, increasing the dose of proziquantal, potentially, and uh, maybe considering other formulations before jumping to off-label. And down here at the bottom, there's publications, so I feel a little bit more confident saying they're out there. There's publications, these drugs are not available in the U.S., so we don't quite have off-label use of them, um, but veterinarians are getting them. And so I just, again, want to say you should probably be doing these top steps before considering these off-label options. And I think it's really appropriate to work through these cases really thoughtfully. And again, if you have these cases that you're struggling to get rid of proglottids, definitely give myself or Dr. Jebba a call and we can help think through these cases. Because they end up looking like this, you should not take a screenshot or try to look at this. This is from the Loftus publication here at the bottom. All I want you to see is they did, they did multiple rounds of proziquantal, lots of different options for flea control. It took them, they worked through this case for almost a year 
lots of things were done before they jumped to the off-label use of that drug. And I think you should really consider thinking through these cases with your favorite parasitologist, we hope it's us here at Case VDL, um, to see what might work uh, before jumping to off-label use or thinking of, of resistance. And again, this, this um, kind of protocol I have here, I don't necessarily think that all these drugs were necessary or what should be done is just to highlight that these cases are complicated and you, you may want to bounce some ideas off of a colleague um, or he, us here at the diagnostic lab. So I think kind of wrapping up, I think the recheck fecal floats are, are so important. We need to be seeing if our treatments are effective. So rechecking about um, 10 to 14 days later. And it gives us landmarks to track, you know, over time, especially if we're switching drugs or trying out new treatments, what is working and what is not working. It also gives us a chance to check back in and say, okay, we had hookworms, we treated them. Do we have something else now? Do we have tapeworms? Did we get all the things that are out there? And then uh, just a pitch, if, if you're doing fecal floats in-house and you think, I don't really, I'm not confident in the recheck part of this, no worries. Um, that's what we here at K-State are, are here for. I'm happy to look at pictures, happy to consult on the case, or happy to look at samples. And so we find lots of pseudoparasites or incidental findings like Imeria, uh, the, the ruminant coccidia in dogs. So making sure that it's a true parasite. We can do quantitative fecal flotations, and that's where we get actual eggs per gram to see if our treatments are working over time. And that may be uh, valuable, especially in these hookworm cases. And we're here for what I call the weird and the wonderful. If you're looking at a slide and you think, I have no idea what I'm looking at, it's definitely not hookworm, roundworm, whipworm. That's where we're, that's what, those are the cases we love, right? We are here for the weird and the wonderful. So reach out to us, shoot us a picture, and we're happy to assess it. We may say, mm, I can only kind of tell what's going on, send me the sample. And we love looking at, at samples and trying to figure out what's going on with the, the interesting or challenging cases you're seeing. And so, you know, you can find both myself and Dr. Jebba um, on the K-State website. Uh, feel free to give us a call. This is our office numbers or our emails if you have cases that you think are of, of interest or challenging cases or just need to bounce some ideas. Lots of times the veterinarians, they're, they're spot on. They're doing the right things. It's just frustrating to work through some of these cases over a long time, especially with clients trying ready for things to be fixed now. So we're happy to just provide that support and say, hey, you're doing the right thing, just keep at it. So please feel free to reach out at, to either of us here at the KSVDL. And we really appreciate you watching the webinar today. Uh, this will be, this is recorded and we're gonna be putting it up on the YouTube channel. So you can look at the at KState VDL website for this upcoming, as well as many other of our um, videos on diagnostic techniques or sample submission. I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Hopefully you have some good ones for me, some tough ones for me. Dr. Hanslicek, we have any questions coming in? We do. Uh, Brian, one of the questions we have is, can you comment on the sensitivity of float, fecal antigen, and fecal parasite PCRs? So the question is looking at flotation versus antigen versus some of the new PCR techniques. And what I can say, uh, I'll kind of piece them out is float and the antigen test, and currently those are offered by IDEX. Um, they align fairly well. The antigen is a little bit more sensitive. It does seem to pick up the parasite earlier because it's not detecting the egg. So you don't have to have reproduction in the egg shedding. It's detecting things from the worm. So once the worm gets in there, it maybe starts shedding the thing that they're looking for. So I will say the antigen tests are slightly more sensitive than a really good fecal float, but the, they align. There's some publications showing they align really well. And the best option would be to do both of those in combination. And then you find like all, all parasites, right? Because the antigen does miss some as well. That's just how tests work. For the fecal PCR, um, I think many of you may be hearing Antec is now offering that as an option. Uh, I will say that uh, in, in the theory of it, I think they're, they've made an interesting diagnostic test. We haven't quite seen um, the data to side by side compare lots of things. It does appear that compared to their in-house testing, the, their fecal PCR does better uh, than their, than their in-house fecals. 
but there hasn't been a lot of publications on that. So I think us as parasitologists are waiting around to see a little bit more data to figure out how we might be able to compare those. Um, and again, uh, I think the idea is good. Uh, just don't have a lot of data to comment or I'm not really an opinion type of person. So uh, I think there's probably going to be in the future antigen or PCR tests that are as good or better than the fecal float techniques and that may move around, move away from using fecals as a routine screening uh, and then just sending the weird things for me to float and look at. Uh, but right now, I think the float has a really uh, valuable place in clinic. Got another really good question. What's the most effective method of decam decontaminating a contaminated pen or holding area that may have a dirt or concrete floor? <clears throat> So uh, doing decontamination for any parasite is really challenging. The, their shells are usually pretty resistant or resilient uh, to lots of the, the products. Usually a quaternary ammonium compound is what you need. You need to make sure that there's plenty of contact time, that you rinse it before putting animals back in there because it's very caustic to the skin. Uh, but other things is if you're cleaning, making sure that you're drying, because one of the things that parasites are sensitive to is desiccation or drying out. So if you're going in and spraying and cleaning and then you know walking away and leaving kind of pooled water, well, that, that's perfect for them. So there's a drying part that it can also be helpful in, in management. And not to be too flippant, but if there's a dirt floor, good luck. Um, it is very challenging. And so if there's a way to raise them up off of that in any way, um, you know, I've even recommended putting kind of like almost decking, I don't, not wire crating for these, right? They, they deserve better than like wire crating, but some like decking, some plastic decking planks so that when you're washing them, the, the wash kind of goes underneath into the, the soil and you can kind of feel better about you got the decking planks or whatever clean um, because if they're on soil, there's just not a really great way to get rid of those parasite eggs. It just is a, a yeah, a, a lose. There's no way to battle that, honestly. Okay, we've got another question. Would you treat a puppy with Giardia fecal float negative and Giardia antigen positive? So the, the question on treating a young, young puppy, Giardia float negative, uh, antigen positive, you know, with those younger puppies, they often need a little bit of help to with their immune system to kind of handle the Giardia infection. So if they're there with you, they're clinical. So the, the Giardia antigen test really should only be used in clinical animals. And that's how IDEX pitches it. Um, so if you are using the antigen, they're positive. They're clinical, I would treat. The float is less sensitive. And again, if you combo the techniques, the most sensitive technique is an IFA that no one does. Uh, you can get close to it if you do a float and an antigen test, and the combination of those, you know, are close to the kind of the gold gold standard that no one does. So it's not surprising that you have a Giardia float negative, antigen positive, even in a clinically ill animal. And if they're clinically ill, I would treat. Right. Um, <clears throat> honestly, if you were to do a float and it was negative and and it was clinically ill, and you still thought it was Giardia doing an antigen test would be my next recommendation and then treating based off of that. So in that kind of discordant results, I would still treat that animal as long as, you know, it matches what's appropriate for the clinical setting. Another question that just came in, if we have a photo to share with you to get feedback on Parasite ID, what is the best way to submit that? Uh, is it by email or is there a submission form for this? And what is the fee for this service? Yeah, so when you're submitting a, a picture, we, both Dr. Jebba and I take emails, and so um, happy to look at those uh, images. We do have a fee for images. I honestly only reserve that for things uh, that it's gotten out of hand of like a normal collegial um, help with cases. And so if you have one, you're like, this is kind of a tough case. Uh, what do you think about this? Or I've never seen this before. I'm happy to answer that email, no charge. You just send an email and that's that's great. Uh, if it's something where you want me to look at all of your diagnostics, we do have a, we do have a, a fee for images, but I haven't had to use that. 
Um, things I could suggest is try to take as high quality a picture as you can. So if you've got that one technician that's really great at using their phone, uh, finding the right spot to get a good image, that can help us a bunch. If you do have an ocular ruler, so a size ruler, that would be great to have that in the image because I often can't tell the size of the, the parasite when, when it's kind of distorted via taking a picture through your camera. And if you don't have one, you don't have to get a whole new a microscope. You can just get an eyepiece that drops in um, that has a ruler. So that helps us kind of decide the size um, and it may help me. So really, if you submit a picture in, I'm, we're happy to look at them. And then sometimes I just say, I have no idea. It doesn't look like a parasite. I have no idea. Can you send me a sample? Or I have some kind of idea and we can kind of think through that case. So I, I, I'm happy to take pictures. Okay, well, I think our time's up today and appreciate you, Dr. Heron, for spending time with us. There's a lot of really good information that I know I could have used in practice uh, back in the day. Uh, appreciate all of you participants for spending time with us. And again, please fill out the survey, give us some guidance. Uh, we'd like to continue uh, putting on these webinars. And again, uh, do not feel, uh, always call us. If you have an opportunity to call us or email us, please do that. Like I said, we love to communicate with practitioners. So uh, any way you can communicate with us would be great. So. Uh, survey and then just look in your email we'll when we have the next webinar up and going we'll uh, we'll notify you and hopefully you can you can join us then so have a good day